terrible story of the infant boy dragged away by dogs and then come back as a sort of redundant ghost is a story that weaves its way through many Native American cultures as though one tribe after another passed it between them. Early American dogs, of course, didn't have names. They were mostly one species and not evolved into the many, many breeds and crossbreeds that dog lovers enjoy today. The early American dogs were still very faithful and loved their owners and came in use for fetching wild fowls shot through with arrows over water, for example. But they also had a malevolent and dangerous aspect as this small ivory sculpture depicts. Indeed, a dog could turn on its owner at any time back in those days, sometimes stripping its owner's throats out. Though when dogs had a white aspect, such as this one does, they were particularly frightening, especially if come upon in the night, which in those days had no electricity to light it. The maker of this ivory work, then, was certainly mostly bothered by the sight of a certain dog, and therefore a heavy, heavy believer in the story of the lost infant boy who came back to haunt its tribe as a curled thing that lay in corners, a ghost that made no nuisance of itself other than to appear in a startling fashion, and if at sup, wooden bowls and spoons might be tossed into the air in fright. Imagine if you saw the child appear and then disappear in the corner of your teepee. Hurrah! It's a Castina doll, found again through Native American culture and being as full of good luck as their stuffing would allow. When appearing in a Native American camp, decorated with two nipples and a belly button, the Katsina doll symbolized hope and prosperity, and you can imagine the Native Americans hiding the dolls for each other to encourage surprise good luck. Can't fault the British Museum here, but by the end of the next paragraph, I will once again take the museum to the wall take it to the mat. What the hell is that? One might ask, and it is indeed difficult to discern, even more difficult for the British Museum, who saw fit to provide no label whatsoever when the piece is a simple shawl clung around the shoulders of some old Native American woman whose youth had passed like a dying rose. Two Native American canoes here, one smaller than the larger one, so that the child in the small canoe can paddle after its parent in the larger. Known collectively as a terrifying uh, branch of both the Mayans and Aztecs, the Huaxtecas were lovers of violence, hallucinogenic mushrooms, and sacrifice. If a civilization were ever to disappear, it couldn't have happened to a nicer bunch. As you can see how they represented the human, and in a moment you'll see how they represented animals, then you can see how they thought of humans and animals. That is specifically a monkey, a kind of ghost monkey. But these Huaxtecas first thought of everything as evil instead of how we've learned to think as everything of, is good. And, and so daily the gods of their own sky hell demanded sacrifice, which the Huaxteca would execute mostly with the, these tree-like swords with one main blade and a lot of little blades branching out. A Huaxteca was lucky to get to his 27th birthday, and so began the tradition of modern rock stars. 28-year-old Huaxtecas and beyond were despised, hated, driven out, or killed, but most likely always killed. 
It's surprising, really, that the Spanish got away with conquering the Huaxtecas because the Huaxtecas killed everything. They were not impressed uh, with, uh, they were not impressed by the white men on horses, certainly knew they, they certainly knew they could bleed like everyone else and probably even sensed Spaniards were trouble. So it's a surprise, really. It's a very big surprise. The Huaxteca could have faced down the very tide and wind if such battles were allowed by physics and nature. The Huaxteca would kill everything. They'd kill each other. They were bad stuff. And lucky for the animals of the jungle, because otherwise they couldn't have killed their food and would have had nothing to eat, because they certainly weren't going to sit around growing things when there were nightmares to exploit. What is the British Museum does have in common with the Mayans is it loves to see a head on a stick, but in this case they mixed up the motives. The Mayans would have honored this man. He wore a turban and was likely a prince of the Mayan hierarchy, which meant he got to eat magic mushrooms and watch sacrifices instead of the other way around, getting sacrifices getting sacrificed and watching people eat other people eat magic mushrooms and not let him have any just to think back then in mayan times how human sacrifice was okay with the populace can you imagine a populace nowadays just handing over their sons and daughters to be killed and or sacrificed by the king's decree you know like a modern government coming down the street and pulling every virgin out for sacrifice for the good of the country and so on not that the mayans didn't have their good points but it's certainly modern civilization that's got it together anyway a mayan prince would wear a turban and get himself carved out in gold like a god a mayan prince made up in gold into a brooch you know it must be a conundrum for the British Museum. They don't want to display him because he's not white, but then again, he is a member of the ruling class.